last class of this module on enzymes and enzyme mechanisms, we will be looking at specific enzyme mechanisms in terms of the types of catalysis possible. In our previous lecture, we looked at acid-base catalysis, and we also looked at the several enzyme classes and the specific reactions that they catalyze. In this lecture, we will focus on covalent catalysis in the example of proteases and metal ion-based catalysis. In these, we will look at specific proteins, trypsin, chymotrypsin, their binding pockets, what we mean by a catalytic triad and metal ion catalysis in some examples. Now, what we have is in the important aspects of covalent catalysis indicate that there is a covalent bond formed between the enzyme and the substrate as the name implies. Now, the indication that we have a covalent bond, which indicates a very strong bond as opposed to the other non-covalent interaction types in terms of where we are looking at acid-base catalysis in the sense of the formation of a hydrogen bond or a proton donation or a proton acceptance. So a proton donor acceptor system or an acid-base system where we had the histidines, as we saw in the previous lecture, where we are not having any covalent bond formation. So we understand that the presence of a covalent bond means there is a strong connection between our enzyme and substrate. And it, the process has to be such that this, this bond has to be cleaved for the enzyme to restore its original confirmation for the active site so that it can then bind another substrate. So the active site in this case is in the enzymes of the examples that undergo covalent catalysis. They have a reactive group that is usually a strong nucleophile that temporarily becomes covalently modified in the catalytic procedure. So the important aspects of covalent catalysis indicate that there has to be a strong nucleophile and it also has to form a good leaving group because as we realize, we do not want the bond to be too strong so that it cannot be broken in the catalytic procedure. In this case also, we have imidazole and thiol groups and specific coenzymes like thiamine pyrophosphate and pyridoxal phosphate. There are three stages of covalent catalysis. In the first stage, we have a linkage and then we have a covalent formation. Then subsequently, we have to have a release. In this release, so there is a nucleophilic attack of the enzyme on the substrate that is going to result in a covalent bond formation and there is going to be elimination of catalysis by a reversion of step one, which is not shown in this particular indication. So the process here is that we have a covalent bond formation, followed by which there is a catalytic reaction, and there is going to be a reversal, or rather the cleavage of this covalent bond that was initially formed to bring back our enzyme to a position where we, it is able to bind another substrate. The examples of covalent catalysis are mostly shown in proteases. Now, proteases, as the name implies, catalyze the proteolysis, that is the cleavage, of polypeptides into smaller peptides or amino acids. This indicates the cleavage of the peptide bond. This cleavage is possible through several enzymes. For example, at pH 2, pepsin is able to hydrolyze proteins to peptides. Then the classification of these proteases comes from the specific catalytic residue that's, that is involved in the 
covalent catalysis. So what we are looking at is in a specific example of proteases, we have the cleavage of the proteolysis or the proteolysis of the peptide bond. Now, we realize that if there are such proteins that have the capability to break a peptide bond, they are actually detrimental to be having in the system in their active form because of the numerous proteins that are there, which would mean that these would go about their job of proteolysis. Nature has devised a method for this where there are zymogens that are inactive enzyme precursors called proenzymes. That is an actually inactive form of the specific enzyme that has a proteolytic nature or a protease. The proteolytic enzymes are therefore made as larger inactive precursors. We realize it would not be a good idea to have them as they were without being inactive. If they were active, they would break the peptide bond. So the protease zymogens are synthesized in the pancreas and they are activated in the duodenum. For example, enteropeptidase is one such protein that converts the trypsinogen into trypsin. That is the serine protease under hormonal control. Then we have proelastase, procarboxypeptidase, prophospholipase. All of these are proenzymes. And the way they act has been shown as an example here in the activation of trypsinogen to trypsin. So we have trypsinogen. There is a cleavage about a specific bond that will result in the formation of another enzyme that is going to be important for our catalytic process. So this can be a self-activation or an auto-catalytic process. We look at serine proteases where the active site is serine. As we mentioned, the name, the terminology of the proteases is based on the type of covalent bond formation that occurs. So this is an example of a serine protease, the chymotrypsin molecule. As mentioned, they are synthesized as zymogens in the pancreas. Then they are transported to the small in intestine and activated by selective proteolysis that is going to give us rise to the enzyme of the action as we had seen before in the zymogen action. Now the serine proteases, that is the chymotrypsin, this, as like any other enzyme, has substrate specificity. The substrate specificity in terms of chymotrypsin is that it cleaves selectively at the carboxyl side of aromatic side chains. So we have tryptophan, tyrosine and phenylalanine. So chymotrypsin has the capability of cleavage at the carboxyl end of the aromatic residues. Trypsin selectively cleaves at the carboxyl side of basic amino acid residues like arginine and lysine provided it is not followed by a proline because we know that proline is an amino acid and the orientation of the backbone may be in a manner that cannot be bound to the active site of trypsin. Similarly, elastase, that is, selectively cleaves at the carboxyl side of small residues, in this case, valine and threonine. So we, if we look at the backbone conformations and the active site residues of these three enzymes, we will see chymotrypsin is shown in blue, trypsin in yellow, and elastase in green, and the active site residues in red. As we can see, the disposition of the active site residues is the same. This is because their functionality is the same in the cleavage of the peptide bond. 
If we now look at substrate specificities, as we saw, this was established by X-ray structures that established the specificities of the three enzymes that we spoke about, where we would have chymotrypsin, which we mentioned had a capability of cleavage after the aromatic side chains, which would indicate that it would fit into a specific hydrophobic pocket that is located near the catalytic groups here. Here is our serine. In the same way, we look at the other chymotrypsin case where we have the serine replaced by an aspartic acid here. And this trypsin molecule is preferable to basic amino acid residues in the cleavage of after the carboxyl side of the basic amino acid residues and it has a specific binding pocket understandably an acid so that there is an electrostatic interaction in the recognition of the substrate in the elastase there are small hydrophobic molecules that align the active site as well that help in the recognition or the binding of the small amino acid residues which are going to be cleaved. So this cleaves substrates with small neutral side amino acid again on the carboxyl side. So we have the specific sessile bonds indicated. These are the peptide bonds that are going to be broken in these three types of enzymes, the chymotrypsin, the trypsin, and the elastase. And the substrate specificities specificities are due to relatively small structural differences as we can see in the active site binding cavities and we realize the importance of the recognition based on the residues that are present in the active site. So we have trypsin that looks at cleavage at the C terminal of the basic amino acids and we know that this charge on the carboxylate comes from the aspartic acid in trypsin and chymotrypsin cleaves the amide bond following hydrophobic amino acids where we have now a hydrophobic pocket that is going to accommodate the substrate. We will just be briefly looking at the serine protease mechanism where we have the active site structures as we looked at and we know that we are going to have a covalent linkage that is going to be brought about by the serine. So the serine is the nucleophile, serine 195 is the nucleophile and we have a covalent linkage formed which is important in the breakage. So here is our peptide bond that is going to be cleaved and here we have the R2 being lost initially, the R1 still connected, which will subsequently be released. So we have conditions here where we have the catalytic triad where the aspartate 102, which is located here, acts to orient the histidine 57 that acts, as we know in previous cases, as we have seen, as a general acid and base. The serine 195 is the one that forms the covalent linkage. And in the formation of the covalent linkage, we have the active site and we have these orientations of the active site residues possible where we have a stabilization of our molecule. Now, Without going into too much detail, but just to understand the beauty of the breakage and the recognition of how the molecule is able to enter the active site, there is a covalent bond formation. And then we have the cleavage of our peptide bond. So we have an initial product form that is going to be the cleavage end of this where this is our product form where we have the cleavage around this. We realize that there is a catalytic triad. The catalytic triad, the importance of orientation, importance of connection, importance of 
acid-base catalysis. And in this case of covalent catalysis, a formation of a covalent linkage, which subsequently breaks to bring back our original enzyme, which is usually brought about by a hydrolysis or an attack by water. So the active site in this example of a serine protease chymotrypsin, the catalytic triad has histidine 57, aspartate 102, and serine 195, each with their own roles to play in this catalytic reaction. There are other examples of covalent catalysis where we have sucrose, that is a combination of glucose and fructose, where we have a glucosyl residue that is transferred to the enzyme, followed where we have the glucose donated to the phosphate and the formation of the product. Another example is papain. This is also a proteolytic enzyme. And here it is, uses a catalytic dyad with a deprotonated cysteine. So in this case also, as in a covalent catalysis, we have a covalent acyl enzyme intermediate formed that frees the amino terminus. We have to realize that in a proteolytic system, we are cleaving the peptide bond. These are proteases, proteolytic enzymes that are cleaving the peptide bond. So there are the generation of a new amino terminus for the cleaved peptide and a new carboxyl terminus. So the enzyme is then deacetylated by a water molecule that releases the carboxy terminal of the peptide. So if we look at this here, again, we have ionizable residues, histidine and cysteine. There is a specific picture of what we can look at, as in the orientation where we have an active site cleft that can bind the enzyme. So the end uh, the substrate. So if we look at the titrations of these curves of the two overlapping titrations of the pH rate profile for papain, it is interesting to note that we have two cysteine 25 and histidine 159, and the pKa changes to such a degree that allows the specific catalytic reaction or the specific role of cysteine that tells us that these two ionizable residues are involved in this particular catalytic cycle or the catalytic process, the catalytic reaction of this protein. In our next examples, we will be looking at metal cation catalysis. In the catalytic metals in the end, Zymes, many of them are there, and we can see there are zinc, copper, magnesium, manganese, iron, and a whole list of such metals that are present in enzymes. Now, what are their roles? The specific roles, these metal iron cofactors that can act as catalysts, they have more than one third of known enzymes are actually known to require metal ions for catalysis. The metalloenzymes also, we will look at, be looking at metalloproteins, they contain tightly bound metal ions. And the smaller ones where we have sodium, potassium and calcium in the alkaline ones and calcium, they play structural roles rather than catalytic roles. And we have Mg2 plus and Zn2 plus that may be structural or catalytic in the roles that they play. So the way they participate in the catalytic process is that they can bind to the substrate in order to orient them properly so that they can participate in the catalytic reaction, or they can mediate the oxidation reduction reactions through reversible changes in the metal ion oxidation states. As we can see, there is iron there. So there can be a reversible change in the oxidation states that will facilitate the specific oxidation reduction reactions. It can also electrostatically stabilize or shield the negative charges, them being positive in nature. And often the metal ion can also act like a proton that polarizes the water to generate OH-. 
we will be looking at some examples. So the types of catalysis that involve metals are oxidation reduction reactions, hydrolysis, and phosphate and oxygen transfer. In the examples, we have, therefore, electronic transfer possible, electrostatic stabilization, activation of the substrate coenzymes and water molecules for a reaction, a catalytic reaction that is going to involve a metal. The example that we will be looking at is carbonic anhydrase, where a catalysis occurs in the formation of the bicarbonate ion. This is the catalytic site of the enzyme active site, where we see the zinc ion in a specific location because of the role that it has to play. And the coordination for the zinc ion, as we can see, is with histidine residues, which we will see in a moment. In the metal ion catalysis, therefore, that occurs in the overall reaction in the catal catalysis where we have the formation of the bicarbonate ion from the carbon dioxide involves a metal-induced water deprotonation using the zinc, which is the metal that is present in the active site of carbonic anhydrase. This is the location of the zinc in the carbonic anhydrase, and these are the histidine residues that are involved in its catalytic activity. So this is the overall, the overall example of the catalytic cycle. So these are the histidine residues that are involved in the coordination of the zinc. We have this zinc activated. We have the carbon dioxide come into the picture and the bicarbonate being released. So if we just look at the enzyme action, the role of the zinc that plays that it plays in carbonic anhydrase, this is the way it is connected. The three histidine molecules that hold it together in the linkage. And it polarizes the water molecule. So the water molecule that is attached here is polarized by the zinc that then attacks the carbon dioxide, which subsequently is linked to the Zn2 plus in a manner which is then hydrolyzed to form the bicarbonate ion. And we have our imidazole connected zinc 2 plus. So this is the overall reaction that occurs as we can see it. And another example that we will look at is enolase. Enolase is a process that occurs, in, we know glycolysis, that converts glucose into two, three carbon molecules that are called pyruvate. And the energy released during glycolysis is used to make ATP. Enolase is an enzyme that catalyzes a specific reaction of glycolysis. And the metal ion works by binding to the enzyme at the active site, as we would expect in a metal catalysis, to produce a specific conformational change. So what happens in this case is the enolate, in the presence of magnesium now, catalyzes the elimination of water from two phosphoglyceric acid molecules. So we have two phosphoglyceric acid molecules attack bound to the enzyme in an example where we have the metal in this case mg2 plus that catalyzes the elimination of the water in the event forming phosphoenol pyruvate which we know is important in our glycolysis reaction specific reactions there so when we look at the catalytic mechanisms we have looked at acid base catalysis we have looked at covalent catalysis in the formation of a covalent bond and subsequent cleavage in our proteases, in the proteolytic enzymes that involve the cleavage of the peptide bond. Then the metal ion catalysis where we looked at several examples and had an idea of which metals are actually involved in the catalysis which involves the metal ions and the roles that they can play. The electrostatic catalysis that involves the electrostatic interactions in mostly all the cases where we have an interaction between the specific residues involved in catalytic reactions. 
the types of residues, and we also looked at the proximity and the orientation effects. This is the end of module six, enzymes and enzyme mechanisms. The books that we have followed have been specified in the specific lectures and 